Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I saw Professor uh, Rashad. I'm very happy to see you again. And they see it. so it's very interesting. I think we have Saad Yassim also with us. And uh, so I think we have uh, some people in the panel. And uh, it's very important uh, to know that uh, we have uh, multidisciplinary topics. And one of the topics that we are very much looking for, first, the, the, the new innovation on uh, new material, new devices, highly efficient solar cells. And uh, we have today Professor Mohammed Nasruddin. In Arabic, we say is Nasruddin. And uh, he is the top. <laughs> for me, he's the top for, uh, for uh, first before for desensitization solar cell when he worked together with Professor uh, Gritzel and afterward he's working for for his own and uh, Professor Gritzel is also a, 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 a great research and, and uh, dedicated to research and teaching and I hope we will invite him in a time yeah uh, so innovation is very important we have today a, a very very important talk about perovskite you will know everything what you want to know very advanced about uh, perovskite from professor nasruddin from from lab to fab he is working on proof of concept he has a proof of concept he has a small module and you will see all this stuff I don't believe if I need to to show who is uh, Professor Nasruddin. He is very well known, and uh, I just maybe I will share my screen before, and I will lift it again, and uh, just to show a little bit. Uh, do you see the the screen? Do you see everything? Yeah, the screen? Yeah. Okay. See. So uh, Professor Nasruddin, he is. Uh, He's of course uh, working actually as a professor and has a huge lab in in FPFL. FPFL is the the uh, we call Polytechnic, we call uh, Polytechnic Federal de Lausanne. If we speak this in in, in, in French, and he's uh, I think uh, one the top ten researcher in the world after time. Uh, of, high, of higher education for his research and for the impact on perovskite material and device. Just this is enough to to uh, to talk about Professor Gretzel. Of course, he has a H index of 143. It's a huge. Yeah? It's not easy. And he he's not the kind of person just to sit in his uh, office and other people work in the lab. He's, I saw him many times, he go to the lab and he work hard. And that is one of, that's why he has uh, good results. Uh, because if professor go to the lab and see what's going on, hand on experiment, then it will work. And I think I am very proud to, to, to be friend and colleague of professor Nasruddin. So I will give him the floor, the virtual floor, to talk about the engineering of perovskite composition for efficient and stable, stable perovskite solar cell. So uh, I will leave the, uh, the, uh, the, the screen now. So this means I need a few seconds for that. And I will give him the, the floor. So please go ahead. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, for the audience, please enjoy this talk. So, please. thank you, Professor Ahmed, uh, for your kind introduction, which I really appreciated very much. Um, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to present our recent results on this forum. And thank you, all the participants, for coming and listening to my talk. And if you allow me, I would like to share my presentation. So can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. Okay. So let me just take the laser pointer. Um, so Ahmed, how much time do I have? Uh, I think you have, uh, we are 11 
The next speaker is, is Dr. Shad Yassin at one o'clock, I guess. He's with us, so he, he can confirm. So between 11 and one, we have a two hour, but in between we will have question. Maybe we can make a video regarding some activity in Morocco. So you, you can have uh, one hour, hour plus and even more. Okay. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. No, no, we, now don't... we want to have the maximum from pair of skies from you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this. And so I tried to share uh, our recent results on perovskite uh, solar cells. And as you can see, the title is an engineering of perovskite composition for efficient and stable perovskite solar cells. When you see in the literature, you must be looking at uh, several publications where still people are working to stabilize the perovskite solar cells. So the, you will see how we are trying to improve the stability of the perovskite solar cells by interface engineering. You will see how we are developing the new materials to interface engineer. And also compositional engineering of perovskite is very important. Uh, so depending on the, on the students or participant interest, I can dig into, or you can prepare the questions uh, to ask me why we are using this type of additives. For example, when you go into the, my presentation, there will be some additives. And you can ask why we are doing all this. If I want to explain all this in the presentation, it will take a long time. Uh, but I try to explain the reasons behind our approaches. So with that um, introduction, so this is the title of my talk. Um, so I'm Nazir Odin, and I'm working EPFL Sion. So it's EPFL is a federal institute. We have a, it's a branches in different French speaking area. One of the branches in Sion. So I am located at Sion, which is 90 kilometers from Lausanne. Uh, on the bottom, you can see my email address. So if you have any queries, uh, please uh, do send me. I will try to answer your queries as soon, as soon as possible. So I'm working at EPFL. I was in a uh, world-class university professor in Korea University uh, and visiting professor at King Abdulaziz University. So let me just take you to the, uh, these are the cred um, credentials which uh, Professor Ahmed has already introduced you. So I'm highly cited uh, from 2014 to 2021. Uh, and in sometimes uh, a very highly cited and uh, um, with high H index of 153 now. Now uh, this is our institute. Um, it's very, uh, this is the main campus, uh, not in the Valley, Sion. This is a main campus located on the sites of the um, Lake Lemma. On uh, the, the other side, we are having a Alp Mountains. So this is our, uh, library and here on the on the on the left bottom side this is our congress center the next year we are organizing ips 23 meeting uh, hopefully it will be on on site if the pandemic goes there so you are all welcome to attend this IP, ips 23 meeting so i just uh, contrast the two technologies here on the right side what you are seeing is perovskite solar cells. On the left side, what we are seeing is silicon solar cell fabrication technology. So let's start with the perovskite solar cells on the right side. So the perovskite solar cells is a conceptually very simple. It's a solution process book. That the, the main advantage of perovskite solar cells compared to the silicon solar cells, which I'm showing on the left side, is the solution process book. The energy input for silicon solar cells is almost um, huge, it's 1,400 degrees temperature, which we have to apply to melt metallic silica and to grow this uh, uh, crystal growth of uh, silicon materials. On the contrary, perovskite solar cells, we can fabricate at 120 degrees temperature. You can see the, the basic energy input is enormous on, in silicon solar cells compared to the perovskite solar cells. And in not only that one, the another disadvantage of Silicon solar, I'm not saying the silicon solar cells are, are not good, but they are excellent. However, they do have a footprint of enormous carbon dioxide. For students, you can immediately imagine silicon wafers you produce from metallic, uh, uh, converting silicon dioxide into metallic silica uh, that already produces a huge amount of carbon dioxide. So we also have a, not only energy input, but also we have a huge amount of carbon dioxide footprint. So here, what we do is 
perovskite use solution process between the two layers. One on the bottom, it's called electron transport layer. On the top, we are having a hole transporting materials. So when you excite these perovskite materials, um, they create a charges, a positive and negative charges. The positive charges goes to the hole transporting material and negative electrons goes to the uh, electron transport material. So this way you collect all these charges at the interfaces. And the beauty of this material is when you excite the perovskite solar cells, the creation of the charges are instantaneous. You will see in the next two slides, I will explain what, are, what, do, what do I mean by instantaneous um, creation of charges. So that's how the solar cell works. But the another beauty of the solar cells is we can also inject carriers. From, for example, I inject positive charges through the whole transporting material and electrons from the ETL layer, then I can get the, the emission for coming from this perovskite material. So it's a, a dual functional a chip. In one way, it generates electricity by taking the solar sun light. And at the same time, if we inject the carriers, it gives you the light. Now, depending on the band gap of these materials, so here I have used a red emitting material. So the emission is red. I can also use uh, the green emitting material. That's a bromide perovskite. I can get the green line, green light. And if I change the perovskite to the chloride, then I can get the blue light. So now you have a RGB colors. So this technology is viable for solar cell applications and light emitting diodes. So with this uh, basic introduction, I go to the, what is perovskite actually? The perovskite is a, uh, is a discovered 120 years back um, in Russian mountains. It's a, the scientist is uh, this named after Perovsky uh, geologist name. So it's a, that's how the perovskite came. So the perovskite formula is very simple. It's a ABX3. A is a, a cation, A cation. That's a monocation, cesium, methyl ammonium, or formidinium. And the B cation is a dication. It can be lead two plus, tin two plus, and the X is a halide. As I mentioned before, if it, it can be iodide, chloride, or bromide. If we use iodide, the band gap is uh, too narrow. And if we use bromide, it's an intermediate band gap, which gives you a green emission. If you use chloride, the band gap is too large, it gives you the blue emission. So this way, you can tune the band gap of these materials by changing the halides. At the same time, you can also change a min minor uh, band gap tuning by going from cesium to methyl ammonium to formidinium. At the same time, by changing the B cation, you can also decrease the band gap significantly going from lead to tin two plus. However, if you look at in the periodic table, the stability of tin two plus is very low. It naturally tends to give two electrons to oxygen going back to tin four, thereby changing the properties of this material. So that's the reason why tin, using tin in the perovskite became rather difficult and a challenging topic. However, there are people who are trying to mix lead and tin, it's called mixed uh, metal perovskites. And this is going to be a future, um, very interesting research topic if the students wants to work on this topic. Now I come back to the, the main important properties of these materials. If you look at the, I have highlighted only three main properties here. Strong light absorption. Next slide, you will see um, what I what do I mean by the strong light absorption. It absorbs uh, the whole visible region from 400 to 800 nanometers. Tunable band gap. This topic we have discussed already. I, we can tune the band gap by changing the halides, by changing the B cation, a small to some extent uh, changing the A cation. The small excitation dissociation energy. This is very important. If you look at the uh, many organic or in organ many organic compounds, when you excite, you will create electron and positive ion pair. It's called exciton. And then the exciton binding energy is, is quite high. And we need, require, it requires energy to dissociate. In the case of perovskites, the moment we shine the light, the charges are created automatically and they are collected at the interfaces. So the binding energy is typically uh, below 30 milli electron volts. It's, a, it's insignificant. So there is an argument. Do we have a exciton with a short-lived exciton or instantaneously we are creating the carriers to extract at the interfaces? Now, as I mentioned, the absorption spectral properties are shown 
on the left side. So this is absorption spectra of a, a typical perovskite absorber. When you excite in this absorption maxima, you can see a typical emission maxima, which is coming around 780 nanometers. So another important property of this perovskite, which I have not highlighted in the previous slide, is the sharp onset. If you look at the onset of gallium arsenide, this is a gallium arsenide, which is the champion cell having 29% efficiency. And you look at the silicon, uh, that's a crystalline silicon solar cells, the onset is a sluggish. And if you look at the perovskites, they're overlapping a sharp onset similar to gallium arsenide. So this gives you opportunity to, to use these materials for a tandem configuration using silicon and the perovskite where the perovskite absorbs the, uh, uh, the high energy photons, leaving the low energy photons to the silicon. So this way you can increase your power efficiency over 30% theoretically. But today, the highest power conversion efficiency of silicon perovskite solar cells is reported by Oxford PV, which is 29.5. So now, after, after looking at these properties, um, you can think of making devices. So there are several configurations, but let me highlight uh, three important configurations on the, on the figure top left. And this is a, a crystal structure of the perovskite materials, which we have discussed in the previous slide. Now we can make the perovskite solar cells using these three configurations, B, C, D. So what are the differences in these three configurations? Let's take one by one. So we have a conducting glass, and then we put the blocking layer of TO2. This is typically deposited by spray coating method, followed by TO2 as a nanoparticles deposit on top of a blocking layer, infiltrate perovskite solar, perovskite material, um, then followed by the whole transporting material and gold. So this configuration is called mesoporous NIP configuration. Now, if we remove this mesoporous layer, TO2 layer, then it's called a planar NIP configuration. It's exactly the same as on the B, except we have removed the TO2 nanoparticles using as a, a compact layer of uh, TO2 followed by absorption layer, that's a perovskite, followed by whole transporting material. So this is NIP configurations, where the electrons are extracted through the conducting glass um, on the bottom side. At the same time, if you look at the D configuration, so the electron transport layer on the bottom side, that's on the transparent glass side, is reversed to the top side. And here we are putting a, a whole extraction layer on the conducting glass side. So this is only the difference between the NIP and the PIN. So since uh, given the time uh, constraints, uh, only we will be discussing NIP configuration. However, PIN configuration also equally good, but the highest efficiency in the literature and in our lab is based on the planar NIP configuration. Try to uh, remember. So the take home message is there are three configurations. Uh, the best efficiencies are based on planar NIP perovskite solar cells. That's a C configuration. That's what we are going to discuss now. So that's a, the detailed structure is shown here. Um, this, this work is, a, we just communicated to Nature Energy. So we hope that this will go through. On the right side, what you are having is a cross-sectional image of the, our perovskite solar cells. On the left side, it's a cartoon, just to, to give you the, uh, to explain much better fashion. So here, uh, the way I have discussed, we have a, a conducting glass, FTO, followed by compact layer of TO2. On the top, we have deposited mesoporous TO2 layer. And remember here, we have a tin oxide, a thin layer on top of TO2. This, why we are doing the two metal oxide layers, you will see towards end of my slide, uh, presentation on around uh, slide uh, 47, where we are using uh, two uh, metal oxides to improve the stability. So this you will see towards end of my presentation, but just note here, we are having a two types of metal oxide layers as an electron transport layer. Followed by, we have deposited a perovskite material on the top, uh, which is not very visible, which is not very visible, but imagine that we are having a very thin layer of a two-dimensional perovskite. Now I just go back and then highlight what is two-dimensional, what is three-dimensional. So this is this perovskite is when we are having ABX3, 
where A cation is inserted in the cavity of the perovskite uh, lattice, it's called a, a three-dimensional perovskite. Now you will see in a couple of slides later, what is two-dimensional perovskite uh, before I jump onto the two-dimensional perovskite. So here, remember that we are depositing two-dimensional perovskite on the top of three-dimensional perovskite, very thin layer, uh, which is not visible, but you will see in the spectroscopic characterization how, uh, how significant uh, the characterization techniques are. Then followed by we having a whole transporting materials and then a gold as a contact. So this is a configuration, typically this is NIP configuration as shown here. So using this configuration, the highest power conversion efficiency in our lab, here is the short circuit current, 25 milliamps, and the VOC is 1.15, uh, the fill factor is quite high, uh, 82.5, and the power conversion efficiency is 24.33 in the lab. However, I just want to remind you, Korean groups, they have certified 25.5% efficiency. We are very close, but not uh, the record efficiency. So this, uh, this solar cells we have sent to Newport to make it a certification and they have measured and the efficiency was 24 plus or minus 0.77. So this is the certified data coming from the Newport in the States and the previous data is measured in our lab. So our data is consistent. Uh, if you look at the VOC, uh, the current, that's a 25 milliamps as I before mentioned, and the VOC is very close, 1.14 and the fill factor 0.83. Uh, 83.8. So this way we get very good efficiencies uh, measured in, uh, in Newport. So as I mentioned before, we can tune the colors. So here is the one color. This is a replacing iodide by bromide. And that gives you this type of color with the mixed halides. So there is no, uh, uh, I, I'm not mentioning exact ratio. It's, uh, you can get the brick red color followed by uh, different shades of the black color. And then you can also get a uh, a yellow color. So these are the tunability of the color uh, for the building integrated applications. At the same time, we can also reach very high efficiencies around 19% using plastic substrate. That's a flexible solar cells. So this have a, they have a, their own applications um, as reported by other authors. It's not our paper. The other authors have reported uh, in 2015 possible applications of drone applications using uh, flexible solar cells. Now, so this, this presentation I also gave in uh, uh, DIVA, that's a Dubai Energy Ele Electricity uh, Department. So since uh, they have a lot of these high-rising buildings, I, I was uh, highlighting this plastic solar cells can be wrapped around these buildings so that these buildings can become like power generating houses. So, um, so in, instead of going for the large scale production, what we did is we have taken our mini modules, that's a seven by seven, and we integrated into A4 size uh, public, um, um, uh, mini modules. And the current is, you can see it's a 45 milliamps current already at room light conditions. And the power conversion efficiency at that time was 21.7. Today in the lab, uh, which we have sent again, sent to uh, Newport for certification, uh, we got 23% on the mini module size that say, this is a quite remarkable achievement uh, with respect to the power conversion efficiency close to silicon solar cells. Now, uh, this is a one publication, it's not mine. I have taken from the literature to highlight the importance of um, sil perovskite silicon tandem solar cells. So if you look at the configuration, silicon solar cells, they come in, in a different configurations. So N terminated or P terminated. So here, this group, particularly the Berlin group, uh, published in uh, in Science 2020, they have used the N-terminated silicon wafer. So when you shine the light, the electrons comes on the top, and the positive charges goes onto the bottom. So the electrons coming on the top uh, will be recombined in a recombination zone, which is deposited on the top of silicon wafer. That's called ITO. This is a recombination zone. On the top of the um, recombination zone. The whole transporting material, um, it's a SAM, that's a self-assembled monolayer, or PTA, this is a polymer, we will see the structures later. So this is type of whole transporting materials are deposited, followed by perovskite solution process on the top of this uh, wafer, and the lithium uh, fluoride, um, then the carbon C60 as electron 
um, injection layer followed, uh, sorry, electron transporting layer followed by tin oxide. And then we have a, this uh, um, uh, uh, conducting substrate on the top of tin oxide layer. When you shine the light from the top, so most of the visible light is absorbed by the perovskite layer up to 800 nanometers. And now it creates a positive and negative charges. Uh, positive charges goes to the ITO site and the negative charges goes to tin electron transporting layer. So the positive charges coming from the perovskite and the negative charges coming from the uh, silicon wafer, they recombine here. And now what you collect is uh, uh, electrons from the top cell and the positive charges from the bottom cell. And if they are current matching, then the VOC um, is, uh, you can multiply the current with VOC of the two cells, which can be 1.8, 1.75. So here are the different whole transporting materials. So here a SAM and PTA, the SAM I have highlighted different carbozole type of whole transporting materials, which has a anchoring groups on the top. So these anchoring groups, this is very important. These anchoring groups attaches to ITO and then forms a self-assembly monolayer and acts as a whole transporting material. So PTA is a well-known whole transporting material in the literature. So they compared the efficiency of PTA, which is 25% efficiency. And using this carbozole self-assembly monolayer, there are several carbozoles, methoxy substituted, uh, propylamine and methyl substituted. So these are the various substituted carbozole self-assembly monolayers. The best one is a methyl um, carbozole substituted uh, material, which gives a 26.41% efficiency. So this is the perovskite, silicon perovskite. So here on the B, on the in between, we have a cross-sectional image of this uh, tandem configuration. So now if you look at the power conversion efficiency, um, this group, they have reported 29.1% uh, efficiency. Um, same, um, similar type of uh, silicon perovskite solar cells, Oxford group has reported 29.5. So it's in the range of 29% efficiency. Now, if you look at the IPC measurements of these two cells, the perovskite solar cells that's on the top is generating um, close to 20 milliamps short circuit current and the bottom cell, which is a silicon solar cell, which absorbs from 800 to 1,200 nanometers, close to 1,200 nanometers, generates almost equal current. Since the current is matching, the VOC is an additive. So if you look at the VOC, as I mentioned, it's almost 1.85 to 1.9. So mostly it's a 1.15 is coming from the perovskite solar cells and 700 millivolts coming from silicon solar cells. So that's how they reach very high efficiencies and the fill factors, um, everything is perfect here, except if you look at the stability data, the newly developed whole transporting materials gives a, after up to 300 hours um, loss of only a 4.5% loss using the whole transporting material with self-assembled monolayers. On the contrary, the literature uh, standard material, um, which gives a, of only 75% of efficiency remained after 100 hours, showing that this newly developed whole transporting materials shows a huge promise for stability. Now, I come back to the uh, people who are interested on the market analysis. Um, so if you look at the initial energy consumption, if we want to make a silicon and perovskite solar cells, um, the energy consumption is almost 300 uh, millijoules per square meter, which is close to 880 uh, uh, kilowatt hours of energy is input. And if we want to do the same uh, tandem configuration or uh, just a, a standing standalone uh, perovskite solar cells, so the energy input is, is less than 500 uh, millijoules. And the payback, energy payback time of this initial energy consumed uh, for the silicon perovskite solar cells can go up to two years. This is even though it's uh, optimistically shown 13 months, but it can go up to two years. For perovskite solar cells, it can be up to two months. That's the energy payback time. So now I just let me summarize what we have discussed so far. We have seen in the perovskite solar cell efficiency reaching 25.5%, that's in the literature. In my group, we are reaching 24.7% efficiency, certified at Newport. Silicon solar cell efficiency, which is known in the literature, which is 26.7% efficiency. 
tandem solar cell efficiency, we have discussed 29.15 because I have, I'm showing only the Berlin group data, Oxford data I, I don't have, even though they have reported 29.5% efficiency. However, if you look at the um, uh, another point, what is missing in perovskite solar cells is the stability. Even though energy payback time is two months, but the missing property of this perovskite solar cells is the stability. Now, if you are interested, that's what we are going to discuss now, how we can improve the stability of these beautiful materials. Let's start. So the outline of my presentation is shown here. So what we will we have discussed so far, the perovskite solar cells, its importance, but we have identified one uh, drawback, that's a stability. So how can we improve the stability? Can we increase the stability by interface engineering? You will see what I mean by interface engineering. Compositional engineering of perovskite layer itself. And development of charge transporting materials. Here we have a two types of charge transporting materials, electron transporting materials and whole transporting materials. So can we modify these uh, charge transporting materials to increase the stability and at the same time increase the power conversion efficiency? So these are the three lines which I would like to highlight so that the students can enjoy and then they can think of their own uh, ideas for in future. So let's uh, discuss with the perovskite. So this is the perovskite which we have discussed, three-dimensional perovskite. When we mix the lead iodide and methyl ammonium iodide, that's a, uh, a composition, it uh, spontaneously forms a three-dimensional perovskite structure like this one is shown on the top left side. Now, if the cation which is inserted in these cavities is bigger than the Goldsmith tolerance factor, then we slice this uh, three-dimensional perovskite into various dimensions. So this is a n equals to one low-dimensional perovskite. This is a low-dimensional perovskite but two layers are joined together. This is called, named as a n equals to two. That's a two layers are joined together with a big, ca in ca big organic cation slicing this perovskite. And the third example, which I'm showing here, just to understand what, do, what, what, what these bigger cations are doing, this perovskite. So here, if we change the ratio between the smaller cation to the bigger cation, you can see n equals to three. So this way you can control the, um, the number of layers. So what, what it gives you is a n equals to one, it's a highly blue absorbing material. As we increase the n number, it goes to like a, like a normal three-dimensional perovskite. Okay. So here on the middle uh, C panel, um, I have highlighted a couple of cations, but there are plenty of cations. So the main cation which we'll be discussing is the phenyl ethyl ammonium. So if you look at the phenyl ethyl ammonium, this is the one cation which we'll be discussing, followed by we'll be substituting protons by fluorine groups. Then you can ask why we are doing this fluorine substitution. Perovskite composition has iodides. And if you look at the basic chemistry, there will be halogen bonds. The interaction between the iodide and fluorine can be enhanced this way. When we deposit this two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskite, we want to create an interaction between the two layers that's, that you will see in the presentation. Now let's go to the properties of these two materials. Three-dimensional perovskite, we have discussed, it absorbs up to 800 nanometers, the black dash line. Now, if we replace this cation by this one of these bigger cation, organic cations, and it forms a two-dimensional perovskite. Now, if you look at the compare, and contrast the absorption spectral properties of the three-dimensional perovskite and the two-dimensional perovskite, that's a, um, a, on, the, on the right side of the panel. So the two-dimensional perovskite absorbs only up to 500 nanometers. This is not sufficient. What we want to do is combine the beautiful properties of the three-dimensional perovskite, which absorbs strongly in the whole visible region, but instability is uh, significantly uh, is there. So we use a two-dimensional perovskite on the top of three-dimensional perovskite so that the two-dimensional perovskite, they are very stable, but not absorbing in the whole visible region. Combining these two properties to get the uh, high efficiency and high stability. That's what uh, you will see in my presentation. So now look at the two-dimensional perovskite spectral properties first. So phenyl ethyl ammonium taken twice, lead I4. This is the two-dimensional perovskite uh, composition 
the absorption spectra, as I mentioned, show, shown before, absorbs up to only 500 nanometers. The maximum is around 500 nanometers. It's a, a blue absorbing material, two-dimensional perovskite. Now, if you look at the XRD, um, this is around five to theta. This is a characteristic peak of uh, two-dimensional perovskite. The remaining peaks just uh, keep it sight. So we focus only the characteristic finger uh, print of this two-dimensional perovskite XRD peak, which is around coming around two theta five. Now, take the three-dimensional perovskite. That's a black line. Absorption spectra is shown on the right side, and corresponding uh, XRD data is shown here on the on the bottom. And so it, it has a around 14 characteristic peak of the three-dimensional perovskite. Now, the next slide, next data which I'm showing is the two-dimensional perovskite deposited on the top of three-dimensional perovskite. That's a bilayer configuration, three-dimensional perovskite followed by two-dimensional perovskite. Absorption factor is this red line, which you will see here. Now, corresponding XRD data shows the presence of the two-dimensional perovskite and the presence of three-dimensional perovskite, which is a four and a five, a two theta. So these are the characteristic peaks. Spectroscopically, you can prove that we have a two-dimensional and three-dimensional perovskite layers on one on top of each other. Now, how can we prove additional? So here, the photoluminescent spectra. So we have taken here the, the first configuration, the mesoporous uh, perovskite and IP configuration, three deputy perovskite followed by two-dimensional perovskite. Now, when we interrogate from the top side using 450 nanometers laser, what you see is emission coming from this uh, two-dimensional perovskite, followed by, um, on that, so just follow the red line, and there is a small uh, bump around 760 nanometers that the laser line is a laser light is not only exciting the two-dimensional perovskite, also exciting three-dimensional perovskite, giving this red emission in the 760 nanometers. Now, imagine we, are, we don't have this two-dimensional perovskite, and we take the, uh, the composition I have to mention. The composition here is a, the formula is a cesium. C represents cesium. F represents a formidinium. M represents methyl ammonium, uh, lead iodide bromide. This is a, a standard reference sample. Now, uh, the red one is a, that's a layered two-dimensional perovskite deposited on the top of three cations, cesium, formidinium, methyl ammonium, uh, iodide perovskite. So now if we look at this uh, reference sample, when we excite without 2D perovskite, what you see is absence of this 500 nanometers emission, only uh, the emission coming from the three-dimensional perovskite, showing that the layer by layer deposition is intact and it is working. Now, if you interrogate from the bottom side, from the FTO glass side, and we see what, uh, both the samples, that's a reference sample, as well as layered perovskite sample, they both shows only one emission maxima, showing that the two-dimensional perovskite is limited only on the top side, not penetrating into the bottom uh, side of the electrode. So this demonstrates um, the, the exclusive deposition of the two-dimensional perovskite on the top of three-dimensional perovskite. Now, if you look at the uh, UPS data, this is on the on the top left bottom side, left bottom side. This is the UPS data. Based on this UPS data, we constructed energy level uh, schemes of this perovskite solar cells. The HOMO level of the perovskite, um, and then the HOMO level of the two-dimensional perovskite. This is the yellow line, is well aligned uh, compared to uh, the whole transporting material, which is uh, significantly. Uh, lower. So what happens is, and if you look at the LUMO level of the perovskite and the LUMO of the two-dimensional perovskite, followed by the LUMO level of the whole transporting material is shown here. Now, we are shining the light in the three-dimensional perovskite. It creates the charges, positive and uh, negative charge electrons, and the positive charges are tunneling through the two-dimensional perovskite, reaching to whole transporting material. However, the electrons which are created here um, they, are, um, they are hitting on the two-dimensional perovskite luma level. Since it acts as like a barrier, the electrons are driven back and they are driven towards the electron transport material. So indirectly, what we have created is channeling of positive charges on one direction and the channeling of negative charges on the other direction. So how do we know that this is working? Now, if you look at the uh, reference sample, uh, that gives you 1.09 volts. 
And with your two dimensional perovskite um, as a layered perovskite, that gives you 1.14. So even though the difference in the VOC is a small, but it's a significant to, con to claim that we have reduced the recombination at this interface. Therefore, we are increasing the VOC. And increased VOC uh, with a small increase in the current gives you the high power conversion efficiency. And the champion cell is uh, close to 21% power conversion efficiency. This is based on phenyl ethyl amine PEA is shown here as a two dimensional perovskite interlayer between the three dimensional perovskite and whole transporting material. So, this is what we call interface engineering. Now, if you look at the importance of this uh, interface engineering, uh, just to take focus on the, on the stability data measured uh, by using power uh, point tracking, maximum power point tracking up to 800 hours, uh, just focus on the squares, open squares. Open squares are the perovskite solar cells, layered perovskite solar cells. That's a two-dimensional perovskite deposited on the top of three-dimensional perovskite measured under argon atmosphere conditions, I can see the stability is intact. And the same cell encapsulated with the glass to glass is shown on the filled squares, is overlapping with the inner atmosphere conditions. Under similar conditions, same conditions, however, without removing the layered perovskite, that's a two dimensional perovskite, on the top of three dimensional perovskite, you can see the stability under uh, glass ceiling is decreasing significantly and as well as under organ atmosphere also is decreasing. So the beauty of this uh, two-dimensional perovskite acting as a protecting layer is demonstrated here amply. And the two-dimensional perovskite protecting the perovskite layer followed by increased stability. And also we can see reproducibility of this uh, configuration is significantly higher compared to the previous uh, reference samples. Now, uh, let me, let me just uh, come back. Is it phenylethylamine is the only cation we are having? No, you can, you can think of other cations. So here I have highlighted our recent work. That's a two cations. That's a fluoro-phenylethylamine ammonium, pentafluoro-phenylethylamine. These are the two cations. And using these two cations, similarly, we made a two two-dimensional perovskites. Um, so the, the one with the pentafluoro is a purple one. And uh, fluorophenylethylamine is the green one. Similarly, we have deposited on top of a three dimensional perovskite. The black one is the reference sample. Uh, the blue one is a, uh, with the fluorophenylethylamine cation, two dimensional perovskite. And the red one is pentafluoro. So instead of going all the characterization details, let me go to the directly to the uh, solar cell efficiency data, is shown here. Take the reference sample, that's a 1.09 volt, just focus on the VOC. Uh, using a fluorophenylethylamine, we increase the VOC from 1.09 to 1.13, that's a blue line. And the power conversion efficiency went up from 20.22 to 21.31. And similarly, if you take the three uh, pentafluorophenylethylamonium cation deposited on top of three-dimensional perovskite, increases the VOC from 1.09 to 1.15, and the power conversion efficiency went up from 20.22 uh, to 21.65. Similarly, you can see the stability enhancement compared to our reference sample, pure 3D perovskite is decreasing up after 1,000 hours, over 30% efficiency is lost. But with the pentafluoro and fluoroamine, uh, they are much superior to as uh, the reference sample. So this way you can improve the stability of the perovskite solar cell using this uh, interlayer engineering. Now I come to the composition engineering of the perovskite solar cells. Uh, if you look at the various cations uh, on the top um, uh, left side of the, uh, the screen, you see methyl ammonium, you see formidinium on the middle, and you see the guanidinium. Guanidinium has a carbon and three amino groups. But if you look at the size of these cations and the formation of the cubic uh, structure of perovskite zone is shown here. If the cation size, uh, the tolerance factor within this range between 0.8 to 1, then the probability of forming cubic 3D perovskite zone is extremely high. 
if the cation is too large, they will not form the, uh, the three-dimensional perovskite. If they are too small, they don't form the perovskite composition, perovskite. So guanidinium comes on, on here, uh, too large. But if, you can, we, if we combine these larger cations and with the smaller cations, we can accommodate the larger cation into the smaller cations. Therefore, we can, um, we can increase the stability of this uh, uh, perovskite composition. It's shown here, this is a theoretical analysis. The guanidinium has a three NH2 groups as shown here. These three NH2 groups, is interact with the iodides strongly. So enhancing the hydrogen bonding is one of the characteristic features of these perovskite materials. And that enhances significantly um, the stability of this material when we have this 25% of the gonadinium, 75% of methyl ammonium. The configuration is shown on the, uh, the top right side. Let's say still it's a mesoporous NIP configuration as I'm discussing in the beginning. The power conversion efficiency is not very high, but it's a in the range of 20%. The, the beauty of this uh, guanidinium addition is enhanced stability up to 1000 hours um, with a small decrease initial uh, burnout uh, stage, but it remains very stable uh, up to 1100 hours. So this is the composition engineering of uh, cations. Now I show you uh, two examples on composition engineering itself. So the perovskites, you have a lead iodide and either methyl ammonium or different organic halides mixed together. And here we have used ionic liquid. Now the question is why we are using ionic liquid. Perovskite is ionic compound. When we have these ionic compounds, there are ion migration within the composition. That's one of the, one of the reasons why the perovskite is not very stable. Can we increase the stability of the perovskite composition by using this type of ionic liquids which, which creates an ionic environment and reduces the ion migration. That's the purpose of uh, this ionic liquid. And if you look at this uh, ionic liquid, it's functionalized. On the one side, we have a double bond. On the other side, we have a fluorinated cation. You can imagine the purpose of fluorinated cation is to create the hydrophobicity of this perovskite composition. Why we should create hydro hydrophobicity? Perovskite composition is like a salt, like a sodium chloride. It, it, it attracts humidity and undergoes a decomposition process. If we create this hydrophobicity, we can avoid this uh, decomposition process. Now, I'm just showing, highlighting the XRD data of this particular material. Now, focus on the, um, the, the expanded version, uh, the figure E shown here. Um, so this is a, the, the blank. Um, which, uh, which creates a lead iodide. This is a characteristic fingerprint of print of a lead iodide, which is around 12.6 uh, to theta. Now, if we use a 2%, uh, let's go to the 1%, that's a, a red line. Um, the formation of lead iodide is decreased significantly. And if we use 2% of this ionic liquid, the formation of lead iodide from the perovskite composition is decreased much more significantly. With the 4% of this ionic liquid, um, there is no formation of lead iodide in the perovskite uh, composition. So this demonstrates the stability of the perovskite composition by using this ionic liquid. So the cell configuration is shown here. Again, it's a NIP configuration and absorption spectral properties, they don't change significantly by adding 1% or 2%, 4% ionic liquid. The surface image, is shown here uh, with uh, uh, the ETI. This is uh, uh, the nickname of this ionic liquid, and this is without any ionic liquid. Now, question is, what is this ionic liquid doing? See the on the left side, um, without any ionic liquid, um, this is under uh, air, two months, ambient air, 50% humidity, the perovskite color has gone on the reference sample. And if we put 1%, of this ionic liquid doping, see from the front side and the back side, uh, the color is uh, almost intact compared to the reference sample. This is the one advantage. And now look at the, what is this ionic liquid is doing actually. So this is the similar to power conversion efficiencies. Uh, the reference sample gives you 19% efficiency um, with 1%, 19.5% efficiency with 2% slightly decreasing. 4% is decreasing, but this is the IV characteristics corresponding to IPC data shown here. 
But now question is, what is this ionic liquid doing? So we did the XPS analysis by taking ion focused ion beam um, tunneling uh, from one of these grains from top to bottom. And this is a fluorine uh, binding energy um, as, a, as, as a guidelines. So the zero uh, percent, you can see here, one percent, it gives the this curve and four percent. This is a, a guidelines for the fluorine binding energy. So now what we see in our perovskite grain from digging from top to bottom at zero nanometers, we do have a similar peak as shown here. That's a coming from the fluorine. That's coming from the fluorinated ionic liquid shown here. This is fluorinated ionic liquid. So now we go back and fluorinated ionic liquid at zero nanometers and up to 25 nanometers, it's there. And then followed by 50 and 75 nanometers, it's disappeared. So what it gives you the information is when we are mixing the perovskite with this ionic liquid, um, and the perovskite solution is a um, DMS or DMF, this fluorinated ionic liquid is floating and they're forming a shell on the top of grains and giving the protection to the perovskite a composition. So this is the take home message. And now we have shown the stability data using a reference sample and the and the, uh, and the ionic liquid doped samples here, um, just to, as, as I showed before, up to 60 degrees temperature. Um, this is a reference sample. You can see the formation of lead iodide. This 12.7 peak is a characteristic peak, two thirty peak of the lead iodide. And if the 1% ionic liquid, even we subject to 720 hours of stability data, uh, shows absence of uh, formation of lead iodide. So this is the beauty of this uh, material. I take one more example. This is another ionic liquid. This work is uh, published in advanced materials. So this is another ionic liquid where we are having two double ones on the top. So using methyl ammonium as a, cat, uh, as a pero standard perovskite composition, we increase the efficiency 15 to 17% efficiency. However, by changing the perovskite composition to formidinium and methyl ammonium as shown here, the reference sample gives us uh, 17%, and with the 2% of this uh, ionic liquid gives us uh, close to 20% efficiency um, of, the, of the perovskite solar cell. So what is the beauty of this uh, ionic liquid having double bonds is when you heat, it, it forms a self-polymerization around the perovskite and the grains. So that these are the two um, reference, uh, with, uh, that these are the two examples which I have taken just to, to demonstrate how one can really improve the stability of the perovskite compositions by selecting a functionalized additives. So here is the stability data. Um, that's a with a, a functionalized ionic liquid, polymerizable groups. So after 2000 hours, the decrease in efficiency is less than 10%. Without this ionic liquid, the decrease in efficiency is almost uh, 60%. So the remaining efficiency was only 41%. You can see the beauty of this ionic liquid forming a polymerizable uh, shell on the top of perovskite grains. Now I come to the, um, the last uh, topic of my presentation, development of charge transporting materials. So whole transporting material is one of the uh, important uh, material in this uh, perovskite solar cells. So most of the data, what you see in the literature is based on spirometide. The spirometide has uh, several issues which are highlighted here. Without going further details, let me just move on. Um, the spirometide has a low mobility. When you create charges, the mobility is low. So we have to dope with the different dopants. Uh, one dopant is a cobalt three plus. What does cobalt three plus do? Cobalt three plus um, let, let me just, cobalt three plus oxidizes, oxidizes the HOMO level, it takes one electron from the HOMO level because it's a cobalt three plus, takes one electron from the HOMO level of the uh, spirometide and cobalt three plus becomes cobalt two plus and uh, remaining um, on the spiro, five electrons in the HOMO level. So you have a increased mobility because of the uh, hole here in this configuration. So we use a cobalt three plus, and lithium TFSI, tertiary butyl pyridine as additives, and that oxidizes the spirometide. And therefore, you can also see because of this ionic uh, compound additives, um, so without any dopants, the 
contact angle measurement shows 77 degrees. With this ionic liquid uh, dopants, uh, the contact angle is decreasing. That means it's becoming hydro hydrophilic. So this gives you, um, uh, provokes you unstability in the material. So can we, can we improve the stability? So here is the one design we have came up in 2016. Um, this is a work which we have done with the Kiri, Qatar Energy and Environmental Research. Uh, and we have a joint patent with this uh, institute. So you develop this material and which gives a similar efficiency as the spirometer. And, and at that time, it's a 20% in 2017. And followed by, we came up with, can we remove all these dopants? So here we came up with a new strategy. That's a flat molecules having with the course. So let me just go back one slide. Um, so here, if you look at the, um, the groups, it's a bithiophene. So the purpose of creating, keeping this bithiophene is to enhance the interaction between the perovskite and then the sulfur groups. And they interact significantly and gives you um, better interfacial, interfacial interaction. So similarly, here we have created the same thiophene groups. Um, so if you look at the uh, KR355, uh, which has a one thiophene, and the another molecule, KR321, has a three, 353 has a two thiophene groups in the bridge. But the core is the same, flat core. So take home message, we have a flat core and we have a, a thiophenes as a substitution to interact with the perovskite composition. That's, a, that's the logic behind this one. So since we have a flat core, like a thalocyanins, and they, they assemble one on the each other top, forming a, a columnar structure. And this columnar structure is the one which is uh, inducing the charge extraction through the perovskite through this column. So therefore, we can use this type of materials without any dopants and they get the same efficiency as a spiromatide. So look at the data, spirometer, um, the standard efficiency is 19%. Spirometer is doped with the cobalt, uh, lithium TMS, TFSI, tertiary butyl pyridine. But however, KR321, which has a three thiophene groups, uh, used from the lab directly onto the cell and still gives 19% efficiency. So this is the first time we came up with the dopant free whole transporting materials to reach the same efficiency as dope hole transporting material. And in between uh, the two thiophene ones gives a 15% and one thiophene one is even the lower efficiency. So here also there is a take home message that uh, we need a certain number of thiophene groups to interact with the perovskite, comp uh, perovskite layer to give the enhanced efficiency compared to two thiophene, three thiophene is better and one thiophene is even lower. Uh, followed by, again, the same motive as we have a, a thiophene groups and with the donor groups. Um, so here, this is our uh, recent work, which uh, appeared is in the press. Um, when we use this type of uh, uh, whole transport materials, the efficiency remained after 1,200 hours, um, a decrease in the efficiency is less than uh, 2%. So this is the beauty of this new class of whole transport materials, which we have developed. Uh, this our work is appeared in a small. Um, then I come to the, as I mentioned in the beginning, why we are using uh, two oxide layers. So here is the data. Uh, if you look at the black uh, 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 black uh, um, squares, no, black uh, circles, um, that's a pure TO2. Now, if you look at the red circles, that's a pure tin oxide as electron transport material. And the blue circles is the TiO2 and tin oxide as the electron transport material. Same configuration is the same as before. We have a compact layer of, that's a conducting glass followed by compact layer of uh, TiO2. And TiO2 is a pure TiO2 is shown on this black circles followed by a tin oxide, that's a red circles, tin, tin, TiO2 and tin oxide, and that's a blue circles. So it, uh, it shows you uh, the modification of this uh, ETL layer enhances uh, stability significantly. Now the question is why this is doing. So when we use pure TiO2, TiO2 is a, a photochemically very active material. Remember this point, photochemically very active and it gets excited and it starts eating the perovskites. Therefore the pure TiO2 as an ETL layer 
is damaging interface. So now by having this type of uh, interlayer, tin oxide between the TO2 and perovskite as a buffer layer, you can increase the uh, stability significantly without damaging your inter main interface. So with that one, I would like to conclude. Um, it's just a one hour. Uh, I would like to conclude what we have discussed today is we have discussed interface engineering by designing the two-dimensional perovskite on top of three-dimensional perovskites, and this enhanced significantly power conversion efficiency and stability. And the second take-home message is we have modified the composition of the perovskite either by using the guanidinium, uh, different ratios with respect to methyl ammonium, and increase the stability um, significantly by using 25% of guanidinium, 75% of methyl ammonium. And the third take-home message is we have dollop hydrophobic ionic liquids, that's a fluorinated ionic liquids, and double bond containing ionic liquids that enhances stability of perovskite solar cells. And same time, we have developed dopant-free whole transporting materials comparable to spiro. With that one, I would like to uh, thank all my co-workers who, who has provided all this data and uh, the funding agencies. Uh, and the group members, and thank you for your attention. I will be happy to take your questions. I finished my presentation. Thank you, Professor Mohammed, for this very important uh, introduction to perovskite and all these amazing results on this topic. Yeah. Thank you. You hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Uh, I before I give the the word to everyone i would like to share one slide here just one moment so do you see do you yes. see my slide yes i do okay. see okay so uh, we would like to thank you again for uh, you. for uh, for your uh, talk yes there are some problems uh, so uh, first of all congratulations for this very amazing talk and uh, we offer you the first award from the virtual uh, university for your uh, amazing uh -huh. outstanding talk uh -huh. that thank is, you that, that's a virtual uh, award i don't know if it exists in the in the story of the virtual talks yeah and uh, i would like to give this uh, introduction to arabic world in yes. arabic the regarding your 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 talk and the the, the pit of sky so i will speak uh, in arabic if you allowed me that's fine please go ahead yeah. so al mawad al ghair al mukallafa li sina'ati al khalaya al shamsiya al sabghiya that's the dye synthesization solar cell, what uh, uh, Professor uh, Nazir worked on with together with Professor Gressel. Oh, the perovskite. على شكل أفلام رقيقة تولد الكهرباء عن طريق امتصاص طاقة الفوتونات من أشعة الشمس أو العكس لصناعة الصمامات تنائية لتوليد الضوء. That light emitting diode. Yeah. Because with perovskite, we can also make light emitting yeah. diode, isn't it? That's correct. I haven't discussed that topic yet. Yes. عندما يمر التيار الكهربائي عبر الصمام. This means with the light, we can produce electricity. And with the with electricity, we can produce the light. That's true. That's how it is. بتكلفة منخفضة. And I believe I will mix a little bit of English that the two things in the future, the perovskite for the production of electricity or for the production of light will be the future That's for true. sustainable development yeah. and for energy and for the light for our planet. Yeah. Professor Nadir Din Muhammad Khajar, Ustad, Bimadrasat Luzan, Lilfunun Tatpeqia, 
بسويسرا هو من العلماء البارزين في الهندسة الجزئية للمواد النظيفة ساهم في فهم هذا النوع من الأجهزة وكذلك نقل التكنولوجيا من المختبر إلى التصنيع So he bring the, the, the know-how from the lab to the fab, to the fabrication. سلط الضوء على هندسة البيروفسكايت لصنع الأفلام الرقيقة التي تطورت بسرعة كبيرة خلال السنوات العشر الماضية وتبين أنها قادرة على تحويل الضوء الشمسي أو ضوء الشمس إلى كهرباء بكفاءة عالية فوق 23% I think now Professor نصر الدين هي شو over 24% وهي نسبة كفاءة للتنافس مع خلايا السيليكون التقليدي So the perovskite can compete with the silicon so that's it. نحن محظوظون بوجود معنا في جامعة التعلم الافتراضي البروفيسور دكتور نضير الدين محمد خاجة واحد من العلماء البارزين في الهندسة الجزئية للمواد الوظيفية لتطبيقات الضوئية وتطبيقات انبعاث الضوء الضوء أيضا وهو موضوع ثاني وهو واحد من أكثر الكيميائيين الذين تم الاستشهاد بهم في الخمس سنوات الأخيرة وواحد من بين عشرين عالما حددهم توماس رو رويتر أكثر العقول العلمية تأثيرا في العالم أشكركم جزيل الشكر السيد نور جاو I don't see my my presentation where it is. No, that's here. Okay. So uh, I want to thank you very much about this uh, talk, and I would like to give the 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 floor to uh, Ustad Salim to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words, really appreciate it. And uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Uh, uh, Prof. Mohammed uh, Khaja. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, lecture. And uh, thanks uh, to uh, Prof. Ahmed. Uh, let's open now uh, this session for the questions. Uh, now it's open. Uh, you can uh, put your questions in the chat or you can uh, uh, raise your hands also, and you can uh, have the speech. Yes, uh, Dr. Tarak, uh, please uh, welcome. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum as uh, uh, Thank you very much, Professor uh, Muhammad, for uh, your very rich and your excellent presentation. So, uh, as, uh, as said by Professor uh, Dr. Ahmed, we can figure out the tremendous amount of experiment behind this, uh, the, the beauty of these results. And uh, so regarding this point, so if you allow me and in order to share uh, with, this, with us and with this, the students, your experience regarding the management of results. So did you fully adopt in order to, to get this beauty and this ama uh, amazing result. Did you adopt a, an approach fully uh, empirical or uh, maybe you help also using, uh, using for example, uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, in order to, 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 to get uh, such success, to help you in and more get, getting this, this success. Uh, and I have also a second question. The, found, the, the point I found is also very interesting is, is regarding the certification you, of your results. So uh, you, you show also this certificate of uh, an accredited org organism that uh, also, uh, which is very important to, to make different stakeholders uh, trusting the university result. 
results. So can you also uh, share your experience with us regarding this uh, certification process? Uh, and uh, thank you very much. So this is my two questions. Um, thank you for your uh, very interesting question and also asking uh, this um, involving artificial intelligence. So let me share my expertise. Um, actually, I'm also interested in uh, learning and improving the solar cells by using artificial intelligence or machine learning. So what I have done is, um, well, I just give you this, my uh, last three years experience, we involved one of my PhD students to do this one. But what I have presented, uh, all our data is, it's a chemical in, um, institution, like a, um, when, when we have a huge experience, then you, you understand the problem, the problems are there. So how do we solve? So some of the, uh, the data which we have received um, is, is a unexpected. That's a not totally designed. Uh, for example, ionic liquids, when we incorporate it, we want to reduce this ion migration and reduce the instability, but we never expected that they will go like a shell. So these are some of the unexpected results. But otherwise, it's a chemical um, intuition rather than any machine learning aspect which we have used. It's based on um, the over several years of experience we brought in in this technology. But however, so are, how about the certification? Yes, regarding the certification. So what we do, we make the cells. Um, it's a very expensive process. Each time we send a certification for cert certification, few modules or cells. Uh, it will cost us between six to ten thousand. So, but it's a it's, it's a process is a very easy. So we just inform the Newport and they will send you the invoice. We pay, and then we send the cells to them. They will measure and then they give you the data certification. Uh, your voice is muted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, uh, if, you, if you allowed me a, a small comment, so uh, do you have, I mean, regarding the business plan, so because certification process is very expensive. So um, is there any chance to, to get money back from, from research in order to pay such an expensive process of certification? Um, no, we, we, we do have a projects where we can claim charge to the projects. So we don't have to really go and so several projects. So we, we split this budget into several projects to claim this money. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Mohammed. Thank you, very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Tarot. Well, uh, and let's go for another question. Uh, here is uh, Manan and uh, Mr. Uh, also Hussein. You can oh. please uh, welcome Hussein Ahmoun. You can have your question. You can have your talk. Uh, open your uh, mic, please. So it seems he has no microphone. No, um, uh, it is open for him. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, yes, now it's open for you. You can open. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. We can hear okay. you. Okay, thank you. First, I would like to thank Professor Nawi for, and his uh, committee friend for bringing this, <coughs> this man for us. So my question, uh, I noticed in his presentation, he speak about 2D materials and 3D materials. And he said that 3D materials can absorb all the visible light, but it's not instable. While 2D materials absorb only UV and blue, but it's stable. So by combination, the two structure we can obtain very high efficiency and also stability. So my question here is how he can uh, decide a perovskite that is 3D or 2D? 
because as I know, we use spin counting technology, I think, spin counting technique. So what is the critical to say this, this material is 3D, this material is 2D? Is it because of thickness? Is it, I don't know. I mean, is there any processing in fabrication or something? Yes, um, it's a very pertinent and a very interesting question you asked. And uh, I regret not informing all the details of when we are making these perovskites for ourselves. Uh, for all the students, you can just listen. This uh, question is very important. What he has asked is how we are preparing 3D and 2D. So let me just go back to the soli pre preparation process. When you are preparing the perovskite solution, so you mix lead iodide and organic halide compounds in one is to one ratio. That's our most of the groups they do. So what we do, we take 10% excess of lead iodide compared to the organic cation. That's a A cation, which has a right size. It forms a three-dimensional perovskite. Okay, now we have a excess of lead iodide on the top of surface. Now, once if you form the three-dimensional perovskite by spin coating, uh, you center it, and then you left with the excess of lead iodide on the surface. You, you don't see by visibly um, that I should have presented in a, uh, in a pictorial fashion, but let me just explain. Since you have excess of lead iodide, now I come up with the organic cation solution. For example, we take phenyl ethyl ammonium cation. We dissolve in a solvent, um, with, in which solvent the 3D perovskite is not soluble. So we spin coat this 2D cation. So since the formation of this two-dimensional perovskite and three-dimensional perovskites are instantaneous, so we take this uh, cation, organic cation, deposit on top of already formed 3D perovskites. So the unreacted light iodide on the top of 3D perovskite reacts with this organic cation and forms a very thin layer of 2D perovskite, which is uh, typically 50 nanometers. And this you can judge by exciting from the top side, as I showed in one of the slide, 450 nanometers excitation, you see 500 nanometers emission. That gives you uh, the direct evidence of formation of a 2D perovskite. Now, how do we know it's only 60 nanometers? So the penetration depth of your laser is only 60 nanometers. So now if you see very small bump at 780 nanometers due to three-dimensional perovskite and pure two-dimensional perovskite emission peak, gives you a clear indication that we have a layer by layer. So the preparation technique I should have given in the, in the beginning that we use a 10% excess of lead iodide in order to form this two-dimensional perovskite on the top of three-dimensional perovskite. Did I explain you well? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Yes, I understand, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Uh, there is a question from um, Manali Batas. Uh, she is saying uh, for better stability with the ionic liquid, 1% to 2% for hydrophobic uh, site, can you talk more about the forming, uh, forming uh, shell structure? Uh, this is the first question. And the second, she is saying the coloration uh, shown in the Provax, uh, provascite uh, structure in your presentation was based on DD interaction in the 2D and 3D. Uh, perovskite uh, material in the interface. Interface. Uh, so this is uh, her questions. Uh, please go ahead, Prof. Yeah, uh, coming back to the ionic liquids, as I mentioned, um, so the perovskite has a, a drawback. What is this drawback? So ion migration is the drawback. Mm -hmm. And the second drawback is a hysteresis. What is hysteresis? Now, if we take the IV characteristics, scanning from the short circuit current to the open circuit voltage, and from open circuit voltage to the short circuit current, so these two curves are not overlapping. So this is this phenomenon is called hysteresis. So now we, I, we identified these two drawbacks: ion migration, hysteresis. So the thinking is, can we dope with ions to reduce these two? So that's what it is done. But now we went into the into the detailed analysis and unexpectedly we discovered that these two ionic liquids, which I have shown, even though we have measured hundreds of ionic liquids, I am showing you only two ionic liquids because these two ionic liquids gave a very beautiful results and uh, unexpected uh, findings. The one finding is it forms a shell on the top of perovskite grains. 
in both the cases, one with the fluorinated cation and in another ionic liquid, which has a double bond. So the double bond you can prove outside also, just to take the ionic liquid with the double bond, heat it at 100 degrees temperature, it forms a solid. So this is a polymerizing. So this polymer forms around the perovskite grain, therefore stabilizing the perovskite composition. Now, if I take, that's a answer to your first question. Coming back to the colored panels, no, that colored panel is not with a different 2D and 3D perovskites. That can be a very interesting topic for future, but the colors which you have seen is changing the anions uh, tuning, uh, reducing the iodide composition and increasing the bromide composition to get the uh, right color. Uh, but going to the 2D and get the colors, uh, we haven't done that one. This can be a future project for students. Thank you, uh, Prof. Mohammed. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, soon it, it will happen. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other uh, questions, please? Uh, it is open. Uh, we have the time. Can I have some? Yes. If the, if yes. Only if there is no one. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Prof. Ahmed. So since we, uh, Professor uh, Mohammed, since we, first of all, I want to congratulate you uh, and thank you very much for coming to us and uh, we listen very well to your talk and i think it's a lot of engineering we saw in your talk and since we are talking about engineering and we, we let's start from the uh, bottom up of the solar cell so we start with the ito and yeah. indium tin oxide and indium tin oxide has a work function and we depo you deposit uh, a uh, blocking layer on titanium from titanium oxide is it that's correct and uh, you define the therefore after making ito plus titanium oxide you define already a work function is it yeah that we know because there will be some exchange between titanium oxide and ito and then it will be uh, equilibrium between the two material and then you have one single uh, fermi level or work function now we come with the the next uh, layer, which is the uh, the donor or the acceptor. It's the, the next layer is a, a TO two or tinoxide, both combined. Yeah, the, we, we did the, we did the ITO and then we did the the, the uh, locking layer of TO two followed by mesoporous. Uh, ah yes, 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 that's mesoporous in order to have as high as possible of surface, I guess. That's correct. And then you, you will have a lot of absorption uh, through this. Mm -hmm. uh, here, my concern is uh, to think always about the stability. These three layers, ITO plus uh, titanium oxide blocking layer plus mesoporous titanium oxide. Is there any problem of, super, of hydrophobic there? No, there is no hydrophobicity, but since uh, the light is coming from this uh, transparent conducting glass site. Yes. Um, it's a uh, heating first TO2. So you excite TO2 um, because there is a UV component less than one or two percent. You excite TO2 and this excited TO2 is eating the perovskite. So that's the reason why our recent work, we deposited a thin layer of uh, tin oxide as a buffer layer between the perovskite and ETL layer. So this way, the excited TO2 will not eat perovskite, but it will be in contact with the tin oxide. So it doesn't damage the perovskite. Okay. So now from where the instability is coming exactly? Because that's my, what I want to know. Yeah. By maybe. making layer by layer. I'm just talking about engineers. He, 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 maybe he don't know very much about uh, fundamental science and all this stuff, but he's engineer and he wants to to go ahead and to resolve problems. So, what is where is the origin? Okay. Suppose that I am the engineer and you are the the, the highly skilled scientist. He know everything. He can explain to me. Yeah. So when you make the solution, this is a solution process method. It's not like a high temperature crystallization like a single crystal silicon solar cells. So this is a solution process method. So you do have a defect. It's, a, it's, a, it's impossible to claim it's a defect-free materials. There are defects. So these defects are propagating 
and these defects are the sites for the instability. That's a intrinsic instability. Wow. Now we come to the extrinsic instability. That's because if like a sodium chloride, it absorbs humidity and the perovskites also is ionic compound. It may take a humidity and it forms a extrinsic instability, uh, the uh, seeping of the uh, vapors and this starts decomposition. So then we have a ga gas barrier layers to, to encapsulate so that we can prevent the in extrinsic stability and the intrinsic instability that's a defects and migration, you can overcome with the additives that what we are doing. Okay, that's what, uh, what we, I just want to make, I know a little bit but, uh, about this, but I want to make it a little bit in a, mm -hmm. in a context that people understand mm -hmm. this kind of, of problem. The yes. last one now. Uh, uh, we have a last question uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Park uh, Shafiq, uh, Prof. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear colleague. I, I just want to mention a point regarding the, I mean, the textural propositive because uh, Dr. Ahmed, pointed out the importance of uh, mesoporosity. And I think, I think this is a very, a very important uh, uh, characteristic that also uh, engineering material can, can tune with respect to, uh, to the, the performances of, uh, of, the, of the, the, mater the material. And here we are talk also talking about the stability issue. So I think, I think it has to do with the diffusion process so uh, so did, did 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 you try to deeply investigate the effect of the poros of material porosity on the on the performances and the, particularly with respect to the, the stability since it is the the studied issue um no um unfortunately we haven't investigated the diffusion of these materials with the porosity dependence no we haven't done that one Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Ahmed, uh, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, the last question from my side uh, about the uh, donor and acceptors, which uh, are very important. That's the sandwich for the, the you have the, the perovskite in sandwich between a donor and acceptor. That's true. Do you think uh, that there is a possibility to make this donor and acceptor as inorganic material? For example, copper oxide is a p-type, I guess. Yeah. That's what I know, but there, I'm, I'm sure there are others. Is there any possibility? And if it's, it makes sense, or you have to stay with the organic materials? No, not necessarily. Copper. And copper thiocyanate is a very good candidate. You can get uh, over 18% efficiency. Copper thiocyanate. Yeah, that's, you know, that's organic, that's organic. No, it's a still, we can classify copper thiocyanate as, a organic, as, a, yes, as an inorganic compound. Ah, okay, okay. So it's an inorganic whole transporting material yeah. which can reach uh, between 18 to 20% efficiency. Okay. I haven't included that one, but uh, yeah. nickel oxide for PIN configuration, uh, is also a very good choice. Uh, so it's a nickel oxide, but the problem again is some kind of a step, uh, the toxicity issues are coming with the nickel oxide and the lead, but otherwise nickel oxide in PIN configuration is a very good choice. And what about copper iodide? It's also P-type. It's a, a copper iodide is a P-type. The problem with the copper uh, one compounds are they easily tend to get oxidized. Okay. So, so that uh, that's uh, another source of instability. Okay. And what is the, your progress in uh, substituting uh, lead by tin or something like this? Is it um, you, ha you have some? No, we don't have any good progress on that one. It's because um, it's a inherent property of this metal. Okay. So, if you take the periodic table fourth group, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, and lead. Yeah. As we go from the top to bottom. Uh, if you take carbon, it's a four valency. Silicon is a four valency. So lead is, when you go to the bottom of the column, it's a two plus is more stable. More so stable. pin is, it's very close to the upper elements, which tend to go to the four plus, but it, since it's on the next to the bottom, it can also stay for two plus. And the, eventually in the long run, 
two plus, it gives you two electrons and it goes to the tin four. So there are groups in, uh, in Netherlands who are trying to um, make a alloy between the lead and tin so that you can reduce the amount of lead uh, significantly. Uh, but still, I strongly believe given its electronic nature of these materials, tin two plus cannot be made as a stable configuration until unless if there is a miracle a mixture of lead and tin that gives you more stability. But uh, as, a, as a fundamental in organic chemistry, you can imagine this, this is not going to happen. It's a property of the material. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm ready with my questions. Okay. Uh, the, we have uh, another question here. Uh, if possible, uh, please uh, briefly, yes, you can uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Mustafa, uh, let me open for you. Yes, please, you can go ahead. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Sanuj, uh, please welcome. Uh, he is saying, uh, if possible, please briefly uh, give us some information about this, uh, the state of research on uh, CIGS uh, solar cells. Uh, is there a good uh, future for his uh, type uh, solar cells? Uh, this is uh, his question. Yeah. Um, well, it's, uh, thank you for asking this uh, interesting question. CIGS is a very interesting technology. Um, but this is a, a thermal process and the efficiencies remained in the range of 18 to 19%. And at the same time, if you look at the silicon solar cells, the efficiency has increased to 26.7. With respect to the silicon solar cells, CIGS is not winning. And if you look at the cost wise, silicon solar cells is dominating. In the, uh, for, a, for example, uh, the recent tender in Dubai, it's a two cents per kilowatt hour, two cents. So this, um, this cost is impossible to beat uh, using a CIGS because it's also energy intensive technology and the materials um, in that they are using a, a sodium and potassium and this, they, these are ions also is migrating and having issues of the stability. But in any case, um, the silicon solar cell low cost is the one which is damaging the uh, the business model of CIGS technology. Thank you. Uh, there is a, uh, Mr. Hassan, uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Al Moon. Please welcome. You can ask your question. You can share. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, um, uh, I want to ask one question, and I think maybe maybe uh, Professor Nawi already asked uh, the same question, but I don't understand to answer very well. So my question is. I want to know exactly the origin of instability of for perovskite materials. Is it is it the organic part inside of perovskite? Is because this organic part diffuse inside of of perovskite or what exactly? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, if you remember the structure. Let me just go back to the perovskite structure, NIP. We have a electron transport layer followed with a perovskite layer, followed by the hole transporting layer. And so far we are using hole transporting layer with the dopants. So the, these dopants are cobalt three plus, lithium TFSI, tertiary butyl pyridine. So these dopants are not innocent. They are migrating and they're entering, entering into the perovskite interface. So this is one source of uh, instability. And the second source is uh, the whole transporting materials itself is a, a second source of instability. And the third point is now we are using gold as a contact. Um, in electronic industry, many people, they know when you deposit gold, this nanoparticles of gold, they migrate and then they create short circuits. So now you understand we have identified three sources of instability with NIP configuration. Now, how do we reduce and can we judge perovskite is stable or not stable? Now, let me come back to the a new configuration. It's called a triple layer configuration, which I have not shown you. 
where we deposit TaO2 followed by zirconium oxide as an insulating layer, followed by carbon layer as a whole transporting layer and contact layer, two together. Did you get my point? Three layers, electron transport layers, that's a TaO2, followed by zirconium oxide, which is a, a insulating layer, followed by carbon uh, nanotubes or carbon paste, which acts as a whole transporting material and contact. And now you infiltrate perovskite into it. So based on this technology, it's called a triple layer technology, Wonder Solar from China, they're producing a 200 megawatts, they put 200 megawatts plant. And in our knowledge, and we measured the stability of this type of solar cells, you can reach 14,000 hours without decomposition of the perovskite solar cells. So what does it use you the information? Your perovskite seems to be very stable, but the problem is interfaces and organic compounds. Did you get my point? Yes, uh, I understand. So it's mean we have a lot of problems that we need to, <laughs> we need to face. <laughs> yes. Okay. So with this simple configuration, the efficiency is reached in China and in our labs is a 18%, but it's extremely stable, 14,000 hours. So if you convert 14,000 hours, it can reach 20 years stability. So in other words, if, to, if you want to take a home, uh, take home message is, is perovskite stable or unstable? So take home message is perovskites are stable. Whether perovskite solar cells are stable or not, it depends on the interfaces and it depends on the whole transporting materials. It depends on the configuration. Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking uh, that maybe we can use like first principle calculation, DFT, to study the diffusion of this element. So maybe by using theoretical calculation by DFT, we can solve, we can find a solution to solve this problem. Yeah, but there will be, uh, if we just to follow uh, either LinkedIn or uh, uh, one of the paper which will appear in few weeks, uh, where we have identified how these uh, uh, ions are diffusing into the interfaces. Um, so you, you will see in one or two weeks it will be uh, it will be published. It's already uh, proofs has been approved. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Prof. Razit Toran, please welcome. Well, I have a short question. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Mohammed. Nice to see you again. Nice to uh, see you. It was a, yeah, it was a great talk. So I thank enjoyed you. that a lot. Thank you very much. Also, thank, thank you, you, Ahmed, for bringing us together to this very nice uh, meeting. Uh, so in Turkey right now, everybody is, especially the PV community, is, is now uh, talking about perovskite, future of perovskite, so also industrial uh i mean feasibility of this technology last two days i was in a big pv show in antalya and i met a lot of people from the industry and most of them are asking me questions about the, the future of perovskite the technologies and they are really looking for some uh i mean uh, industrially proven uh and mature uh, technology. So here I want to ask you a short question about the uh, tandem uh, solar cell structures. You know, there are two options here. We have two, two terminal uh, approach and also four terminal approaches. And some in Europe, some of some people, some groups are working on two terminals and some groups are working on four terminals. Which uh, direction you, you think it will be the uh, direction of the industry? Uh, for the future tandem technologies? Uh, yes, uh, it's also a very uh, futuristic question. So my point of view is a four terminal is going to win the concept. The reasons are following. Why I'm favoring four terminal? So if you look at the two terminal, a two terminal configuration, we have to optimize the band gap of the perovskite which is 1.6, 1.7, 1.75. How do we get this band gap 1.75? We have to remove iodide and put the bromide in it. The moment we make the mixed halides into the perovskite composition, the moment we shine the light, these, these two anions, they segregate, they segregate. 
Now you have your two perovskites in your composition. One large organic perovskite, that's a um, organic cation lead bromide perovskite, organic cation lead iodide perovskite. So you are separating the two components. Therefore, the band gap has changed the material property. So now the VOC generated by the perovskite is not the same as we are expecting before. And also the light absorption, which you have limited to 1.7 EV before, is not the same. Now the iodide perovskite goes to up to 1.5. So you have reduced 200 milli electron volts. What are the consequences? The consequence is you have a high current from the top cell and the low current from the bottom cell. So your power consumption efficiency is dictated by the lowest current coming from the, any one of the cell. The VOC is a drawback in the first, in the initial composition, you have a bromide and iodide, which has a band gap of 1.7, that gives you 1.2, 1.3 VOC. Now, by after, after subjecting to the light, they segregate. And now we have a 1.5 band gap. 1.5 band gap gives you again 1.15. With VOC. So these two disadvantages just uh, prevents me to go back to the, uh, the two terminal configuration. Now in the four terminal configuration, I can be independent. So I don't have to match the current. So therefore I can have a better efficiency. And sometimes when the sun is migrating, so the power output may not be the same. So always we get the lowest uh, cell efficiency in the two terminal. This may be, as in the four terminal, this may be totally different. Um, the, in the future, there are a couple of groups, including ourselves, we are working three terminal. So this may have a advantages compared to the two terminal and compared to the four terminal. I don't know whether I, I explained you well. Yeah, yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. The take home message is if you want to start and I want to start, maybe we focus on the four terminal because of the inherent drawback of the perovskite composition will segregate and if it will not have a, a large band gap as we are expecting 1.7 mm -hmm. until unless we come up with the alloy which fixes this 1.7 band gap thank you very much thank you very nice very well answered thank you thank you yes uh prof ahmed uh, timing now Yes, I think uh, I want to thank again, Professor Mohammed for this nice talk and hopefully we will come again to highlight for us new progress also about the light emitting diode based on perovskite and all these very beautiful and interesting results. Thank you again uh, very thank much you. for your uh, kind acceptation to our uh, conference. Thank you, Professor Turan, to be with us.